Christoph Grinna grew up in the District of Columbia and co-founded Uptop Acres in 2014. He got his start farming on an organic farm in Potomac, Maryland, and brought his expertise to the rooftops. Christoph is an active member of the DC Urban Agriculture Working Group and previously worked installing green roofs in Washington, DC. He graduated from the University of Vermont with a bachelor's degree in plant and soil science focusing on sustainable agriculture. As a professor, researcher, and extension specialist, in the Department of Plant Science and Landscape Architecture at the University of Maryland, Dr. John Lee Cox specializes in water, nutrient, and pathogen management of intensive ornamental and crop production systems. He strives to find ways to provide farmers and urban managers their own production and environmental information, utilizing sensor networks and intelligent software. His goal is to help people make better decisions, conserve resources, improve their profitability, and reduce their environmental impact, of crop production. In addition, John is a collaborator of the United States Botanic Garden and he is currently conducting some research on our conservatory's green roof. Thanks so much for joining us today, Christoph and John. And with that, I will pass things over to you. Okay. Um, thanks. Oh, thanks so much, Emily. Um, really excited to be here um, and share some, the work of Uptop Acres and some of the work that we've done with um, John Lee Cox around, um, you know, issues of water management, stormwater management, nutrient runoff management. Um, so to give a little background um, of, of myself further in Uptop Acres, um, we are a rooftop farming and gardening company that is based in the DC metro area. Uh, we operate 30 different um, rooftop growing spaces Varying, ranging in size uh, from the one you see on your screen, which is about an acre of space, 45,000 square feet, um, all the way down to uh, a space as small as 100 square feet. Um, and we are primarily growing uh, fruits, vegetables, uh, culinary herbs, um, pretty much everything we grow is edible. And we are trying to um, you know, spread this sort of this movement of, of rooftop agriculture in urban areas um, as far as we can. So today I'm going to run you through a little bit about us, how we got our start, um, go through sort of our background, um, talk a little about the, the gardens that we have built and operate, uh, talk about where the food goes, and then talk about some of the, the challenges that we um, encounter when we're growing on these rooftop spaces because they're incredibly unique um, and they have their own microclimates, their own um, challenges that you wouldn't find on the ground. Um, and so with that, I'm going to jump into it. So as I sort of alluded to earlier, um, we, we grow food on roofs and we convert the underlie, we convert what we see as underutilized spaces um, into food production sites and environmental safeguards. Um, we're creating space for people to come up to the roof and interact with and learn about food, um, sort of all in the hopes of establishing agriculture as more of a fixture of city life. Um, and so a little bit about who we are. Um, so we all of everyone who works for Uptop Bakers has a wide, um, wide array of backgrounds. Um, none of us really came to this from a traditional agriculture um, standpoint. You know, a lot of us grew up in cities and came to learn about uh, how we, how, you know, about our food system, about growing food um, later in life. And uh, as a result of that, we've sort of come to coalesce around um, this rooftop, this rooftop space. Um, and so, you know, we have experience running traditional commercial farms. We also have experience running community gardens. Um, we have backgrounds in construction. Uh, we also have backgrounds in event planning um, and farm education. And so we bring all of that together to, to sort of uh, run our business and do what we do. Um, so to get started, you know, the first question that we get a lot of the time is why are we growing food on roofs? You know, why not, why aren't you doing it on the ground? This seems like a lot of extra work, uh, a lot of extra startup cost. Um, and as we were, sort of toying around with the idea of getting into urban agriculture back in 2014, you know, what we kept finding was that in, in DC, and this is the case in urban areas around the world, um, there really is a dearth of viable, affordable urban land that can be used for farming. 
Um, oftentimes it is prohibitively cost expensive. Um, and if you can find land that is affordable, oftentimes in urban areas that land um, has been contaminated with um, you know, heavy metals, with, with other you know, sort of forever um, pollutants that make growing food on the ground in that soil um, not viable. Um, and then also, you know, if you can find land that's affordable, not contaminated, um, oftentimes you're going to be leasing it. And, you know, as we know in, in our cities, uh, especially in the United States, uh, that land can be developed very quickly and that can wipe out any investment. Um, and what, so because of those reasons, we sort of look to the rooftops. And what we found is that there is a huge amount of unused, unused space um, on the roofs of our urban buildings. And also uh, by partnering with building owners, we can get them to contribute to the startup and the operating costs, uh, making this a financially viable enterprise. Um, so I'm gonna get into some of, you know, what, what, our, what our growing spaces look like. So the first variety that we um, build and manage are uh, large-scale green roof farms. And so if you're familiar, uh, folks are familiar with what a green roof is, a green roof is basically a specialized um, system that allows you to safely put uh, soil and plants on roofs. They, um, you know, have been around in the world for as long as humans have been creating, you know, dwellings. But in the modern era, they mostly have been adopted for stormwater management, uh, for um, you know, building a uh, green building certifications, um, building efficiency standards. Um, and so what we have done is we have taken the green roof system that's normally planted in, you know, uh, non-functional, mostly um, drought tolerant uh, plants. And we have removed those plants, modified the growing media a little bit to be able to uh, support food producing crops. And we have then, you know, we grow all kinds of vegetables from uh, all the way from leafy greens and herbs, all the way up to tomatoes, peppers, eggplants. Um, and so this is, this is sort of how we got our start working with existing green roofs to convert them to be food producing roofs. And then now, um, you know, building new ones. And this is, this is a really great way um, to take advantage of existing infrastructure um, that has been already built and need and can be modified in a pretty cost effective and, and quick manner to be an agricultural space. Um, the next way that we, um, the next way that we grow is through raised bed planters. So oftentimes um, urban buildings, they will have sort of bare roofs. So these roofs uh, have the waterproof roof membrane, and then they'll have stone ballast over top of it. And obviously, um, you know, that's not, that's not a green roof. So what we do is we have these, um, these very cool modular planter beds that are lightweight, can be assembled easily in whatever shape we want, and we will bring them up and we will install them on these roofs. And they're nice and deep. They're about a foot and a half deep. And we're able to have a, a nice volume of soil that um, supports our full array of crops that we grow. Um, and so this is, this is a really nice creative way um, to bring food production to, to roofs that you think would otherwise not be able to support them. Um, and then the third is we run into all kinds of roofs that have all kinds of issues of access, of load capacity, of different use types. Um, and so we have used a lot of different um, a lot of different solutions over the years. So on the left-hand side, you can see these are um, some woven planter, um, some fabric pots. Um, this building didn't have elevator access to the roof, and I'm going to talk about some of the challenges that we run into later. Um, so we weren't able to bring our planter boxes up, but we were able to bring these fabric pots up, um, and they've been a great solution there. And then on the right-hand side is, uh, is the roof of a restaurant that we've worked with. And so they wanted to have a functional garden, both for aesthetics and also for, um, uh, to affect the layout of the restaurant, but also to be used in the kitchen. Um, and so we really just sort of take a space and then we're able to use that as a canvas to, to build a, a production area. Um, and then uh, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, where does the food go? So 
when we first started our business, we thought, okay, we're, we're going to be a typical farm. We're going to you know, lease these spaces. We're going to grow food and then we're going to sell it. We're going to sell it at farmer's markets. We're going to have a CSA. We're going to um, distribute wholesale to uh, restaurants or, you know, small grocery stores. And we quickly found that, um, that's not a great business model as, um, you know, sort of as agriculture has been throughout, uh, human history. It is a very low margin, uh, low margin business. And when you add in the, um, diff the challenges and the intricacies of doing so across 30 different roofs, the business model really doesn't work. So what we have switched to is partnering with these buildings to help cover the costs of operation. And then um, when we grow the food, about 40% of it is distributed on site in an office building or a residential building um, for free to um, either the office tenants or the residential tenants. And then the other 60% we distribute to our nonprofit partners that are working in food insecure communities and all of that produce is given um, at no cost to them. And so we're, we're able to leverage, um, you know, what we're doing to sort of be a win-win situation. It's a win for our, um, you know, our building clients because they're able to uh, create an amenity that their tenant, their paying tenants can enjoy. Um, it also helps them with their sustainability goals. Um, and then we're also able to create um, some value for, um, our partner organizations that are working um, with marginalized communities in in the area. Um, so these are just some a couple more photos of you know of what we're growing. Uh, and then another part, another aspect of our business um, is, you know, when we built these places, oftentimes we we found that people really wanted to interact with them. And so we wanted to figure out how we can further in integrate the farms and the gardens into the buildings. And we found that the way to do that is through different kinds of event programs. So we'll offer workshops, um, classes, how to plant a garden, how to use, you know, how to prepare things um, that are grown in the garden, um, farm to table dinners with local restaurant partners, happy hours, lunch and learns. Um, we host a lot of school trips um, sort of just trying to activate the space as much as possible, get as many people up to the spaces as possible and sort of disseminate um, information about urban agriculture, about green buildings, sustainability, sort of everything that we touch. Um, and then some more photos, you know, on the left, this is a, um, this is a, a herb planting workshop that we put on for a building. Um, on the right is actually a, a comedy show with, um, with a nonprofit group in the area uh, that works with returning vet veterans um, to uh, in, in arts and theater and uh, performance classes. Um, and then I'll get talk a little bit about uh, some of the challenges that we run into. Um, so the first is accessible rooftops. So not every roof uh, has an elevator that goes to it. Not every roof um, even has stairs that go to it. A lot of them have just ladders that you have to get to. So you know, when we're evaluating a space, we have to be able to bring soil, planters, bring produce down. And so that's that's sort of the first, you know, checkbox that we have to go into is, can can I get to the roof? Um, can we bring materials up? Uh, so that's that's that cancels out, you know, a, a decent number when we when we go tour. And then um, building requirements. So this this pertains mostly to um, the structural capacity of the roof. So, um, you know, every building that we work on, where we work with the property manager to evaluate and make sure the garden or the farm that we're going to be putting up there is um, the building is able to uh, accommodate that structurally. Um, so that's of key importance. And then the second for building requirements is uh, water access. So we need to be able to have reliable building water access. Um, close to the garden that we can hook our irrigation system into. Um, we use drip irrigation um, on a timer to make sure that we are being as efficient uh, with our water use as possible. Uh, and so making sure we have reliable water access is key. Um, and then logistics, um, you know, when we come to a building, we are coming into the loading dock, we're coming into the garage, um, we're bringing our materials um, up 
through the loading elevator um, up onto the roof. So the logistics of dealing with security, of, of dealing with other contractors using the elevator, other people taking uh, you know up the loading dock, um, that's been something that has been a large learning curve and um, one that we sort of have solved by um, converting mo about 90% of our trips to these buildings uh, are conducted via electric cargo bike with a large cargo trailer that can haul uh, over 300 pounds of materials. Um, and so we've sort of cut out those logistics by um, cutting out the automobile um, and, and utilizing sort of this emerging electric bike technology. Um, wind and heat is another thing uh, that is very unique to the roofs. We, every roof is its own microclimate. Um, depending on the side of the building you're on, you'll have different wind patterns, you'll have different exposure to the sun. Um, you know, one side of the roof can be, could be 20 degrees warmer on a, on a hot summer day than the other side of the roof. And so when we're, when we're doing site visits and we're designing gardens, we're taking all of that into account. You know, oftentimes we'll put planters on the north side of a roof that's sort of shaded by the penthouse structure. So that'll allow us to grow cooler season crops in, um, in the summer, you know, and vice versa for southern exposure. Uh, we've had to spend a lot of time trying to find um, varieties of vegetables that grow well on on the roof and rooftop environment um, and then wind in in the sort of in the, the swing seasons uh, we really experience that northwesterly wind more so than you would on the ground and so our planting date is oftentimes a little bit later than you would have on the ground just because some of those late late spring um, you know cold cold bursts and wind can really damage um, the plants. And so we have to be mindful of that. Um, pests, we thankfully, knock on wood, um, until up to now, we have never had a four-legged pest up on the roof. Um, so that's something that's really great and a really great part of being on the roof. Um, we have, we have you know, winged pests. We have birds that will come in and, um, you know, tear up a new planting sometimes. They're not that bad. You know, they like to eat the strawberries, so we have to net that, but that's not that much different than on the ground. Um, in terms of insects pests, you know, some, they find, life finds a way. You know, we have aphids up there. We have harlequin bugs. We have, um, you know, a lot of the normal insect pests you find on the ground. We don't have flea beetles, thankfully. They have not figured out how to, uh, to fly up there yet. I don't think they're, um, they're strong enough flyers. Um, and then uh, financial challenges um, is our last. So that's that's really been finding the startup capital for these gardens, finding out, figuring out what the the, pro the right partnership is with these uh, building managers and uh, property owners to make sure that the garden can sustain itself um, and that we can you know run a run a business that um, pays living wages and more and has a sustainable future um, ahead of it. Um, and then just to touch quickly on some of the tax incentive, tax, tax incentives that are available uh, for property managers, there is a um, there's a property tax abatement that's available in DC to private landowners that utilize their space, their property, whether it's on the ground, inside a building, on top of a roof for urban agriculture. Um, there are also stormwater management requirements. Uh, so every new building is mandated to capture a certain amount of stormwater um that falls on its on its property and a great way of doing that is through green roofs um, and so there is an incentive to install green roof infrastructure um, green infrastructure mandates um, this is sort of along the lines of the stormwater management um, some municipalities are starting to say that you know any new building has to have a green roof or solar on it um, and then there's also green building standards so things like lead certification uh, wellness certification these private um, building certification standards um, that are used as, you know, used to differentiate, differentiate a building from the rest of the buildings, um, we fit in really well. There are credits available for incorporating urban agriculture onto your properties. Um, yeah, and so that's the, the quick and dirty about Uptop Acres. I'm looking forward to answering any questions um, that you all have at the end, and I'm happy to pass it over to, uh, to John Lee Cox now. Well, thank you. Thanks so much, 
Christoph, for a great introduction. Um, my name is John Lee Cox, and I'm a professor in the Department of Plant Science and Landscape Architecture. Um, I just did want to introduce a couple of my co-conspirators, apart from Christoph. Uh, Christoph has been, uh, we've been working with Christoph probably for about six or seven years. Um, but uh, today what I'm going to do is focus a little bit on some of the other challenges that Christoph has faced. Um, and it's not just Christoph, it's urban farmers in general, in terms of maintaining the functionality and productivity of urban farming systems, and specifically hone in on a couple of uh, key, key elements. Um, I would like to point out that uh, some of the research that I'm going to show you was done by a very talented master's student that we had who graduated a couple of years ago, Ian Howard. He's gone on to big, bigger and better things. Um, and uh, my colleague and uh, partner in research, Andrew Ristvi, is at the Y Research and Education Center out on the shore. I just wanted to take a bigger perspective on some of the issues because um, we do live uh, in and around the Chesapeake Bay, which is very important to our local economy, not only Washington, D.C., but Maryland, where we're based. And as you can see from this graphic, um, if you look at the, um, the uh, amount of development pressure in red and, and, and orange, you can see that we're living in a very highly developed area uh, surrounding the Chesapeake Bay. So what we are concerned about primarily is the amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment that reaches the bay. Um, it's a big topic. Um, this is from the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. What I'd like you to just focus in on is the yellow portion, uh, because that's the urban and suburban runoff and in-stream uh, in sediment uh, portions. So nitrogen, phosphorus, sediment. Phosphorus is oft often carried with sediment. And a lot of this is coming from urban stormwater. So it's not necessarily dirty water, but it is water that's running off of our streets, off of our roofs, and all of our impervious surfaces in our cities. Particular to the Washington DC area is the what we call uh, the combined sewer area. And um, I'm not sure if all of you are familiar with this, but the majority of acreage under Washington DC has about a hundred year old uh, infrastructure in terms of pipes. Um, uh, more, more suburban areas now have a dual pipe system. So uh, stormwater and then uh, uh, household wastewater is carried in separate systems. But under DC, this is all combined into a, a sort of a combined sewer overflow. And there are some control devices in these large pipes that uh, enter the bay, but if we receive over about an inch or an inch and a half of rainfall in, in uh, about an hour, these uh, CSOs tend to overflow. And the resulting effect, unfortunately, this, this kind of uh, pollution into, into, the, um, into the bay, particularly around the Anacostia and the Potomac. So, what Washington DC has been doing, and some of you may be familiar with this, is the Clean Rivers Project. Um, so the yellow is the combined sewer outlet, uh, outlet uh, district. Uh, the little dots all around, all down the way, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but all the way down Rock Creek Park, Parkway and all the way up the Anacostia, those are combined sewer outlet outlets into the Potomac and the Anacostia. And because of the um, presidential order that President Obama signed, um, the, uh, the EPA is now in charge of the Chesapeake Bay and all of the total maximum daily loads. So uh, unfortunately, Washington has um, been the target of increased enforcement for nitrogen and phosphorus and sediment. And so what they've done is they've retrofitted in the last four or five years, massive pipes. These are sort of metro sized underground tunnels. Uh, if you look, want to look up the Clean Rose Project, you can take it and take a look at that. But these are pipes in green that actually store stormwater that runs off the streets. And basically in the off peak uh, times, it actually 
pumps it all the way down to Blue Plains. And this is basically to mitigate the nitrogen phosphorus and, and other pollutants that are actually entering uh, the rivers from, from our suburban, uh, suburban um, runoff. That is a $4 billion project. And unfortunately, um, we're all paying for it. <laughs> uh, if you live in Washington, DC, you probably know your impervious area charge, which is on your monthly water bill. Uh, it's prorated according to the amount of impervious surface that's on your property. But the point of it is that everybody is paying, including the federal government. And the federal government owns 18 million square feet of, of impervious surface in Washington, D.C., and so they're very keen on uh, trying to uh, reduce the amount of stormwater runoff um, from, from their, their buildings as well. And that's what I'm involved with with, it, with uh, Green Roof on the Botanic Garden Roof, but uh, that's, a, that's a topic for a, a different day. But I did want to just point out that green roofs are primarily designed for stormwater management. The uh, picture shows uh, the substrate in the green roof. As you can see in this particular um, slide, it's, it's a relatively thin film. It's about four to six inches in depth, but it does form this very nice um, sort of ecological, this is sedum and some other, other weed species actually in this one that you can see the roots. And this substrate actually mitigates about the first inch of rainfall it doesn't necessarily stop it but what it does is it slows it down and it actually actually captures a fair amount of of that and then tra it transpires so the plants actually form this mechanism where they can actually transpire this water back to the atmosphere so it doesn't run down the drain so to get to uh to farming systems now. Basically, we have two types of green roofs, and I'll just connect these to the urban farming system. What Christoph described in, in some of his large larger farms is a more extensive type of system. Um, that's the thin film that I just showed you. But in the deep planters that he showed in some of, some of his uh, up top acre installations is more intensive. And those are the deep planters, um, which may be 18 inches to two, two foot deep uh, in the soil. So the realities of food production is that, and, and um, Christoph very nicely uh, showed some of the some of the benefits, of course, of actually converting rooftops um, because they are in new spaces. But the challenges are that they're usually in, on installed on impervious surfaces. Even a green roof has a has a, a, a liner below it. And so any rainfall that does not get intercepted is actually does run off into, into drains. And then when we get into urban, uh, uh, largest urban systems, uh, like we're doing in Baltimore, um, those are raised bed production and those are typically on in relatively impervious surfaces as well. So those are some of the planters, for example, in Baltimore. Um, we often work with, we've got a big urban uh, farm um, uh, system up in Baltimore, uh, helping, helping uh, local residents um, with their food production needs in food deserts. These systems are typically open, so they are open to, to rainfall, but of course, because you're growing food crops, they do need to have some kind of fertilizer or some kind of nutrient input. And so that's where we've come in with our uh, research to, to try and find out exactly what are some of the challenges and how we can mitigate those. So again, uh, extensive food production systems uh, in shallow, shallow substrates depths um, in, in variation. But the substrates, it's the substrates which are really the focus of our research. And that's the green roof substrates have a shale based, uh, typically a shale based with some organic matter, but they're very porous. And so they're not really designed for agricultural production. They're designed for stormwater control. Um, so in, in order to modify those systems, we have to firstly uh, ensure that they have enough water holding capacity for crop production. Um, 
sedum and other green roof plants are very drought tolerant, uh, vegetable crops not so much. So sometimes we do actually have to supply a supplemental irrigation. And then of course uh, we typically amend those types of soils with some composted um, materials. Uh, this can be leaf litter and some others which I'll, I'll talk about in the next couple of slides. But sometimes we use uh, green fertilizers, slow release fertilizers as well. So obviously those are nitrogen and phosphorus inputs uh, primarily. Um, those are the two which we're concerned about for the bay because those are the ones that are, do drive eutrophication events, they drive algal blooms and all sorts of water quality issues. And that's why, of course, we have the federal mandate to clean those pollutants up from the bay. So just to give a few slides of, of research, I'm not going to get too much into this, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of insight into what we do. Uh, firstly, um, Christoph, uh, it's mandated in, in Maryland, and so they do have um, a farm in Rockville. And so we have written uh, a nutrient management plan with Christoph for that particular operation. It's about an acre uh, roof size in, in uh, Rockville. And um, as you can see, they're using uh, some uh, nitrogen inputs uh, based on the crop that they grow uh, and also some potassium because that's very important. Uh, typically what that's coming in as uh, uh, organic, more organic type fertilizers, um, which are slower release. Um, I do want to point out that they, they are not actually, didn't have any phosphorus inputs in this particular roof with the fertilization, but phosphorus does come in with the composted materials that, uh, that are incorporated. So this is what, what our research focused on. We focused on two types of compost, which are composted materials, which are very, uh, which are used quite uh, frequently in, in urban farming systems. Mushroom compost, Christoph, I don't think has used mushroom compost uh, because it's um, because it, he knows it is quite hot. But uh, some of our urban farms in Baltimore uh, typically have used mushroom compost because it's cheap and it's readily available. Um, and then we chose a yard waste com compost. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, yard waste uh, materials uh, come from leaf litter that are collected from cities and around um, people's people's yards. And uh, in College Park, we have a municipal uh, uh, leaf compost service called, and they produce a, a, a substrate by the name of Smart Leaf. But there's some others, and the Montgomery County also produces, it's Maryland Environmental Services, they produce a very nice uh, composted material as well. So, what we were interested in is how nitrogen and phosphorus moved from these composts, and I'll show you some data in a, in a couple of slides. But we wanted to find out if there was anything that we could incorporate in the substrate that would help us actually hold on to either the nitrogen or the phosphorus in particular. So we investigated a couple of a uh, couple of uh, additions. Uh, one, of course, which you may have heard about, is biochar. Uh, biochar is basically a, pyro, uh, a wood, it's a pyrol, it's pyrolyzed form of wood. It's a bit like charcoal. And um, basically it's, it's uh, produced uh, all over the Northeast and they are amending a lot of soils with biochar because it's one of the ways that we can actually slow down carbon uh, loss from soils. It does improve cation exchange capacity, which is the way um, uh, material that soils and, and other uh, substrates can hold on to cations, but it doesn't do anything for anions. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but it does improve our water holding capacity, so it has some benefits. The other is alumina, which is aluminum, aluminum oxide, um, and it's commercially available uh, from a company in, in uh, Pennsylvania. And this is known to bind phosphate, um, which is important because phosphate is one of the main drivers of eutrophication events in, in, in the bay. So with that, um, that's alumina, aluminum oxide. And basically what happens is that if you have a molecule of aluminum oxide, it binds with, um, you can actually charge it. Uh, so you can actually create a uh, a slow release form of, of phosphorus, but this is the same kind of mechanism that we would use if we added this straight 
uh, directly into, into a substrate. Basically what it would do is extract all of those phosphate ions and then bind them and slowly, slowly release them over time. So just a, a few slides of researchy type stuff. I, I, I won't bore you with all the details, but I just wanted to give you a, a couple of insights. We tested uh, these two composted materials with biochar and alumina, just to find out exactly how much nitrogen and phosphorus was leaching out of each. The main point is the smart leaf is the yard, yard waste on the left. The, on the right is the mushroom compost. And the numbers probably don't mean anything to you, but um, nitrate uh, kilograms per hectare is about the same as pounds per acre. So you can see there's a lot less nitrogen available in smart leaf than there is in mushroom. In, in fact, it's about five, four to five times the amount in mushroom. So mushroom compost has a lot of nitrogen in it. And as you can see, what we did is some leaching events. And you can see uh, these were the equivalent of one inch rainfall events. So you can see with five or six rainfall events, the majority of that nitrogen was lost. It was basically leached out of the profile. So this is a concern because if you're going to, to use these materials, you obviously want them to stick around because the plant is not going to make them uh, be able to, to, keep, to take them up very, very rapidly. On the other hand, if you look at phosphorus, uh, you can see that um, there was a little bit of phosphorus in smart leaf. Um, this is the, all of the different ratios at the bottom are just different ratios and combinations of aluminum to smart leaf to, to biochar that we were, that we were um, mixing. But basically you can see there's a very small amount in a smart leaf, uh, and, but in comparison to mushroom, again, much higher levels of phosphorus. Um, and although it, it doesn't seem like it's a lot about one pound per acre or half a pound per acre, um, that is enough phosphorus if it's consistently leached over time that it would cause problems. So just to give it, oh, just before I go on, what I wanted to just point out though is um, when you combine it with aluminum, so for example, the, the lower um, combinations all have alumina, right? that the, the, this 5AL is the amount of alumina, so the green, the, the orange, those are all incorporated. And what happened was that it, it immediately bound the phosphorus in, in the substrate compared to the unamended uh, components. So when we uh, grew some crops successively, Ian grew three crops uh, successively just in these different, in four of these immediate uh, uh, substrates. He found that in fact, nitrogen was uh, readily available and uh, we didn't have to do any fertilization uh, for the life of the crop. But at the end of each crop, we basically, or at the start of it, the next successive crop, we put on a small amount of uh, nitrogen just to support the initial establishment. And you can see over time that it actually did decrease in nitrogen, but with uh, slightly repeated uh, applications once every eight to 10 weeks, um, we were able to maintain the nitrogen uh, that was uh, necessary for those crops to grow. And just lastly, you can see from the phosphorus results that uh, this is much clearer because uh, the aluminum, the green and the blue is where we actually incorporated aluminum into the substrates. And you can see that basically the amount of leaching of phosphorus in the non-amended, a bigger button, um, were much higher than the amended. What's interesting is that we only added nitrogen in, and so the initial phosphorus supported all of these three crops. We never fertilized with phosphorus again. So we were able to bind the phosphorus and make it slowly available to plants over time. So just in conclusion, we, we found that we can uh, amend uh, some of these substrates with uh, alumina. Biochar didn't really do much because it doesn't hold on to anions, um, but it does increase water holding capacity. Um, so we have to be careful about irrigation and uh, obviously 
we can't do anything about rainfall, but uh, applying uh, slow, uh, lower amounts of nitrogen over time really reduces the risk of any runoff. And with that, I'll show you just some of Christoph's famous carrots. Uh, green roofs uh, grow amazing carrots. Um, so if we have any time for questions, um, I think we can both, both answer those. Thank you. Thanks so much, John and Christoph. Um, great to hear about your work. Um, and yes, we'll open it up for uh, questions from the audience. We've got a few coming in um, as we've been talking. I wanted to start out by asking, could you tell us a little bit about um, the research collaborations that you've done together? And um, Christoph, has that um, led to you changing any practices on your farm? Um, yeah, I I think that sort of from from the work that we've done, we it has influenced a lot of our irrigation practices, um, and sort of has just made us. We've just we've really just moved to as efficient as possible. Um, you know, we used to use larger overhead sprinklers, but we were able to see you know in the monitoring data that we had from the drain gauges that we were that was causing more runoff than we wanted, and so we've since basically switched entirely to drip irrigation. Um, and, and so that's informed a lot of our irrigation decisions. Thanks, anything, John, that you wanted to add about that work together? Well, um, Christoph has provided us with an opportunity to really um, understand systems it's it's sometimes uh, you know when we as researchers we do sort of greenhouse limited studies and um, smaller scale studies so working with Christoph at a commercial scale is really important because um, sometimes you get unintended consequences of of large large events uh, you know large large spaces rather than small small spaces and so it's just uh, really provided us with the perspective that we can now use to inform other other uh, growers in this uh, in this space. Great, thank you. Um, we have had a couple of questions um, about what happens in the winter. Um, Christoph, do you want to do you want to speak about that? That you have one question from another farmer asking about um, how you how you work in the winter. Um. Yeah, we so we we don't grow, we don't try to do any season extension. Um, you know, there's that would we you know we don't have we don't have any greenhouses. You know, trying to put row covers over on a roof in the winter would lead to a lot of lost row cover. Um, so basically, we plant cover crop in the fall. We we plant a mix of um, winter wheat, um, peas some clover, some oats, um, mixed berries, and, and we'll, we'll plant that in the mid to late fall. We'll sort of inter, intercrop that um, with our, our fall planting, and, and we'll let that grow all winter, and then in the spring we'll come um, and we'll smother it and, uh, and then plant it. So all of our spaces, we don't leave any ground you know, uncovered in the winter. We're, we're cover cropping every year. Um, and we typically on, on the larger green roof um, scale growing areas, we'll, we'll do whole season of rest um, in cover crop and then replant. Thank you. I think just to, just to add, um, Christoph, I think you're, um, I, I didn't want to give the impression that Christoph doesn't follow organic principles because they are organic, they use organic fertilizers. Uh, we were not in our in our research, um, but I think their cover cropping is very important for their nitrogen management because basically they're using clover and, and other nitrogen fixing um, legumes like the peas to actually fix nitrogen, and then when they incorporate that in as a green manure in the spring, that provides a long term release of of organic nitrogen for their crops. Thank you. Um, here's a question. What happens, Christoph, when, when building owners maybe decide not to continue to grow food crops or the building gets sold or becomes vacant? Um, I'm not sure. That's never happened. That's not um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that, yeah, we, we, you know, 
the we sort of our clients go into this thinking that this is going to be uh this is going to be a long-term thing um and we've never had anyone that's been interested in you know getting rid of it so thank you but i mean i guess the answer to that it would be an incredibly costly uh right. endeavor for them so and they'd also be taking away a great building amenity um, here's a question. There's a question about pollination. And, and first, um, do you incorporate plants to attract pollinators and do pollinators visit rooftop farms? Uh, yeah, we, we definitely uh, make a lot of effort to attract pollinators. Um, you know, they're crucial for our fruiting crops. And so every garden we have is typically probably 10 to 15 percent of it is dedicated to um, mostly native pollinator friendly, um, plants. So want to create some habitat for them in the growing season and in the, and in the winter. Um, most of our roofs we have bees on too. Um, and so we're sort of trying to create some, some foraging opportunities for, for them as well. Thank you. Um, John, we have a question about Illumina. Um, what is the cost of it on a farming scale and is it a realistic option for urban farmers in terms of cost? That's a good question. Um, it's a relatively cheap material, um, so I don't think it's terribly expensive. And the important thing here is that it's very effective at very low incorporation rates. So uh, a little goes a long way. And so um, I think to answer the question directly, I think it would be cost effective. I think it'd be a question of um, uh, what kind of acreage you were you were using it for. Thank you. And one more question for you, John. Um, is there any research with regard to rainwater pollutants and green roofs? Are they more susceptible to um, to things like jet fuel smog type pollutants? That's a great question. Um, actually, I, I have a, a one of our previous PhD students, Alyssa Starry, who's now at Portland State University, is actually probably she did her PhD with us and she, she was actually our first foray into sort of understanding some of the dynamics with substrates and, and water and rainfall. She's gone further and actually does deal with uh, air pollutants um, and inputs into green roofs. Uh, green roofs are remarkably efficient at reducing uh, uh, smog components. So basically nitrous oxides. Um, I think she's done some work on sulfur, sulfur deposition as well. Um, and the interesting thing is because they are biological systems, they're not just plant systems, they actually are microbial systems. And so once you get those pollutants kind of penetrating the, the plant layer, they kind of get into the microbial component and those microbials, those microbes are fierce, fierce competitors. And so along with the soil chemistry and the microbes, uh, they're actually pretty good filtration systems in general. But I would refer, her, uh, refer you to Alyssa for some specifics. Thank you. Um, Christoph, what sorts of buildings or organizations um, have been the most successful hosts? Um, are you mainly working with businesses, nonprofits, government buildings? And then maybe, John, same question for you. Yeah. Uh, uh, we mostly work with uh, privately owned um, buildings. So office buildings, um, you know, apart residential apartment buildings. That's That's what makes up the majority of our um, of our client base. We've tried to work with um, publicly owned, you know, government organizations, buildings, but uh, both D on the local DC side, Maryland side, and um, less so on the federal side, but the, the red tape has proven to be um, too, too much that it just isn't, doesn't make sense to spend our time and resources sort of waiting and trying to do that. Um, yeah, so it's been it's been all private. I've I've been sort of the opposite, Emily. As you know, I've sort of worked mostly in in a different space to Christoph. I'm I'm helping um, particularly federal government botanic garden, and I've and I've worked with the um, uh, 
the um, some other agencies as well uh, to understand the efficiency of plant systems or biological systems to actually uh, remove stormwater. And so this is the big, uh, I didn't get into it, but I, we can do in the future. Uh, the incentives actually in DC are very interesting. I showed you uh, some of the disincentives, the, the impervious surface fees that we all pay. But the incentives actually are that they do have a, a stormwater credit trading program. And so that's been set up by DOE. And, and if you can prove that you keep a gallon of stormwater out of the, the district's uh, sewer, sewer, combined sewers, um, they will actually pay you to do that. And uh, it's, not, it's, it's, not, it's not pennies, it's dollars. So the latest credit trading, I think, is about $1.60 a gallon. And these are long-term contracts. And so if you multiply the capability of a roof to actually store stormwater and you can trade that, uh, it actually adds up to some serious, serious money. Yep. Thank you. Um, Christoph, you talked a little bit about um, the, the conditions uh, for a rooftop farm, what makes what makes a good space for it. Um, wondering, have you had any problems with roof gardens causing leaks? Um, maybe the conditions weren't right. Um, yeah, it's a great question. So uh, short answer is no. Um, so sort of the way that Green roofs um, are a really great way of extending the life of a roof membrane. They actually um, provide an incredible amount of protection. So if you think about it, you know, a typical roof is just the waterproof roof membrane, um, oftentimes with nothing on top of it, sometimes with like a very thin layer of stone protecting it. That's way more exposed to the elements, to wind, to rain, to heat, um, UV rays, um, and so when you put a green roof on top of it, it's six different layers of uh, specialized layers that act as protective layers. Um, and so you can extend the life of a roof membrane uh, by 2x, 3x when you're putting a green roof on top of it. So as long as it's as long as the roof and the green roof is installed properly, it's actually going to increase the life of your roof membrane. Um, yeah, and then in terms of our our roofs that aren't gardens, um, that are just sort of planter boxes, you know, we're we're very careful to make sure that we're putting down multiple protection layers um, between the roof membrane and the planter box. Um, and so not, we've thankfully never had any any issues. Um, you know, if there are other groups that are you know that work in green roofs and uh, rooftop agriculture in um, in other cities that. They're working on older buildings maybe, and there have been roof leaks. And if that is to happen, basically what you do is you have to remove the soil in that area and someone comes in and they repair it and then you put everything back. Um, and that's a pain. Um, but as long as things are installed properly, there are a, there's a lot of protection that's being offered. Thank you. And a follow-up question, um, what sorts of tools are you able to use and how much of a challenge yeah. is it not to damage the roof membrane? Yeah, um, as you can imagine, you know, we're not, there are no, there are no tractors being used on the, on the tops of these roofs. Um, everything is, is hand tools. We're not using any mechanized tillers. Um, we're basically practicing no-till agriculture. Um, uh, so yeah, a lot of, a lot of hand labor, you know, we're, pretty diligent about our weed management because we have to do everything via hand and that is incredibly time consuming. So, um, yeah, so we're, we're basically following no till. Thank you. And we had another question about, um, how you access water. Uh, yeah. So on, on all of our sites, we are able to tap into the, the building's water supply. Um, so, on the roof, there's a spigot and we were able to hook in and we have a, a, a timer, an irrigation timer that, um, you know, is set to run at a certain um, certain time interval based off of, um, you know, what the what the weather is doing. And, and we're able to sort of monitor that and adjust that as we need to. Yeah, but but it's pretty it's it's nice. We have reliable water um, and yeah. Just to add, Emily, um, 
that we are using sensor-based uh, irrigation technology on the botanic garden roof because that's a very important question actually how do you maintain your stormwater holding capacity in your substrates and yet still provide uh, enough water for, for plants to grow and so Christoph is that's why they're using uh, we, we use sub irrigation uh, drip lines on the on the botanic garden roof Christoph is using uh, drip lines I'm not sure if you're a sub irrigating Christoph but you probably are on drip drip lines so mm -hmm. the question is you can apply very small amounts of water very precisely to the root crop and that's how you maintain you know the balance of, of stormwater stormwater management as well as uh, providing enough water for your crops. Thank you. Um, so we are getting toward the end of our time here. And so I'm going to ask you each a final question. Um, I wondered if you can tell us what is most exciting to you about the future of rooftop agriculture. I know, John, you talked about um, some of your students um, going into exploring new things. Um, do you have any any thoughts on on what's next or what's exciting? Well, I, I, I'll let Christoph have the last word, but what I'm most excited about is our ability to use uh, unused land, untapped potential within urban areas for food production, because there's an awful lot of rooftops up there that are underutilized. And um, quite frankly, we have a lot of food deserts in urban environments, and I just, I, I'm thrilled to be supporting companies like Uptop Acres who, who really are taking on not only the food production challenges, but also the social challenges of producing locally, locally available, nutritious, great food to local communities. Um, yeah, I, I think that what is most exciting to me is that um, just sort of the concept of um, growing food on roofs is becoming much more sort of mainstreamed um, in across industries, um, both across, you know, private and uh, public industries. So just, you know, we found, you know, we've been at this for almost 10 years now. And the beginning, you know, we would go and talk to someone who, you know, an, a manager of an office building, you know, we get like a, slightly laughed out of the room. Um, and now, you know, I think that we're moving towards a point where people are understanding that there is a big value out of this and are treating it as like, oh, this is an amenity that we should have on this building, just like we have a gym in it. Um, or we have a, or we have, you know, a bike parking, you know, that this is, this is just something that should be there. Um, and I also think that because of that, there are a lot of opportunities to incorporate it, um, you know, beyond just what we're doing, which is, you know, to be honest, in higher end, you know, office buildings and, and residential buildings, in that there's potential for, um, you know, local governments to be, uh, you know, setting, creating incentive structures for this to, to be developed um, on more affordable housing communities, both on the ground and on the roof. Um, and I think it's just, it's becoming more mainstream. There are more businesses that are able to, you know, be successful um, and, and find business models that work. Um, yeah, it just, it just seems like there's a lot more opportunity to incorporate this sort of technology. Thanks so much. Yeah, and thanks for sharing. This is really exciting work. Uh, really uh, neat to hear about how it all happens and, and what you're learning from um, the research that you've done together. So thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise with us today.